Sometimes you see them coming and you do everything you can to prepare for it. Sometimes you have no clue it's coming and the storm just catches you by surprise. Whatever the case, storms can be difficult to go through. When a storm comes, nobody can ever be fully prepared for it. It can throw you off balance and you may feel like you don't know what to do. Feelings of anxiety, confusion, and fear may flood your mind. You may ask many questions. You might start to wonder, doesn't God care about what I'm going through? Doesn't he care that I'm deep in debt? Doesn't he care that my child is sick? Doesn't he care that I'm about to lose my job? Will I make it? How will I make it? You know, one day after speaking to crowds, Jesus asked the disciples to cross over with him to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. You see, Jesus was tired and needed some rest. At some point in their journey, a furious storm started raging over the waters and the disciples were terrified. Remember, many of Jesus' disciples were seasoned fishermen. They knew the sea, and they could tell the difference between a normal storm and a really bad storm. They were terrified because they knew that this was a really bad storm. And guess what? Jesus was sleeping through it all. But just because he was asleep doesn't mean he wasn't in control. Jesus knew that his time to die hadn't come. He knew that they would get to the other side of the sea despite the raging waters. You see, Jesus understood that he had the authority to speak to the winds and they would obey him. So he wasn't scared, he didn't panic. The disciples on the other hand were petrified and they asked Jesus, don't you care if we drown? When you feel overwhelmed and the waves are hitting hard and you're feeling tossed to and fro, you may have questions just like the disciples. You find yourself asking God, don't you care that I may drown? But God is saying to you today, just like he said to his disciples on that boat, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? God is saying, trust me, in the middle of the storm, in the most difficult time, have faith, faith that I will carry you through, that I will calm the storm, that I am in control. Trust me. How can you trust him when the situation seems so dire? Lean not on your own understanding. Don't you dare lean on what you know. If you do, then all hope will be lost. With the natural eye, some circumstances seem hopeless, but when you lean on God, on the supernatural, then anything is possible to him that believes. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. And lean not, don't lean on your own wisdom. If you lean on your own understanding, your situations will seem impossible. They will seem unsurmountable. Your mind will tell you that it's all over for you, that there's no hope for the situation. But when you lean on him, on his word, what he has said about your situation, then everything changes. See, he's the God of impossibilities. One day, the disciples had been fishing all night and caught no fish. But early in the morning, they met with Jesus and he told them to cast their nets again. They were expert fishermen, and they thought this suggestion didn't make any sense. But guess what? They caught so many fish that they struggled to pull them into the boat. Jesus made the impossible possible for them. If God tells you to cast your net into the waters again, don't give him excuses. Don't lean on what you know. Trust him and cast your net into the waters again. He will fill your nets as he did for the disciples. He can make the blind to see again, the dead to live. He can turn water into wine. Your situation is not over until God says it's over. Build your faith. Read the word. Read it over and over until you believe it. That's why he left so many promises and testimonies in the Bible. So that when you and I go through these tough times, we will know what God says about it. Why should you trust him? because he has never failed. He will never fail. He cannot fail. He's in the rocking boat. He's right there with you in the storm. He knows exactly what you're going through. 
and his word says, his thoughts towards you are for good and not for evil, to give you a hope and a future. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Like David said, why so downcast, O my soul? Put your hope in God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He deserves our trust. You see, he loves us with unconditional love. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also graciously give us all things? Well, maybe you feel that this time, this storm is too hard. It's too rough. I just can't believe that God is letting these things happen to me. I can't trust him, but you can. If Job did, then anyone can trust God. Job experienced the worst of storms recorded in the Bible. He lost everything that mattered to him in one day. He lost his children, his servants, and his property. When he thought it couldn't get any worse, he got sick with skin sores. It was so tough for Job that his own wife couldn't stand his breath. And like Job's friends, people will tell you many things. They'll say it's because you're not praying enough. It's because you didn't do this or that. The truth is, sometimes things happen to us just because God has allowed them, not for any other reason, not because you sinned or didn't pray enough or fast enough. So stop blaming yourself. We can't live life thinking bad things shouldn't happen to good people. We can't bury our heads in the sand and hope that we never face a storm. As long as we are in this world, we'll have to face some storm. Jesus warned us, he said, in this world, we would have many troubles, but that we should be of good cheer because he has overcome. The storms will come, but he won't let you go through them alone. He won't let you handle it all by yourself. He's right there holding your hand. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. God has promised to be with us and that he has overcome the storm for us. All we need to do is trust him. Trust that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Even when you're too scared, you don't even know what to pray. He knows what is in your heart. He knows what you need. When you go through a storm after losing a loved one and you don't know how to overcome the grief, God is saying, Trust me, trust that I love you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. You, your walls are ever before me. Like Job, you will overcome the grief. You will smile again, and you will find strength in him to face each day. Job found the courage to believe in God despite his circumstances. In Job 19, 25 through 27, Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end, He will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. I myself will see Him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Such faith, such trust in His God, that no matter what, He called God His Redeemer. And God did restore Job. It may have looked like it was time for Job to give up and die. It may have looked like a hopeless situation. Even Job's wife asked him to curse God so he could die. Job's wife thought it was all over. But God is bigger than all your troubles. God restored Job. He restored his family, his servants, his property. In fact, he was more blessed than before. Job died as an old man and as a fulfilled man. God is not limited by time and space. A day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day to Him. He will turn your life around in ways you can't even imagine. He can turn your life around in one day. You just need to trust Him. Like the psalmist in Psalm 16:3 had determined in his heart, fix your eyes on Jesus, refuse to be shaken, Trust God because He's the only one who really knows what you need, what your heart's desire is. God is the only one who understands where you're coming from and where you're going, and He is kind and loving. If you ask Him for a fish, 
he won't give you a snake. If you ask him for bread, he won't give you a stone. Matthew 7:11. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Trust him. When your enemies come like a flood, the Lord shall raise up a standard against your enemy. Do you know what that means? It means that God will divinely defeat your enemies, no matter what your enemy is. Your enemy may be fear, anxiety, and depression. No matter how big your problem is, it doesn't matter what the storm is or the size of it, God will be over and above it. He will use His might, His authority to overcome the storm from every side. He will fight your battles. He will give His angels charge over you. This battle belongs to the Lord. God is fighting for you. The Lord is a mighty warrior who is great in battle, so you need to put all your trust in Him. Trust that God is able and He is willing to help you. Refuse to be intimidated by that storm because Christ lives in you. You can face tomorrow. You can face the future. You can trust that He who began a good work in you, in your life, in your family, will be faithful to complete that work. Trust that as long as God is for you, nothing can be against you, and He is never late. In our eyes, God may be taking too long, but He holds times and seasons in His hands. He'll be right on time with your answer. Whatever things you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received them, and they will be given to you. Because God is listening, He's not ignoring you. He's at work in your life, even when you can't see it. He is making all things work out for your good. He's opening doors that nobody else can and making the impossible possible. Trust Him in the storm. Let Him fight your battles. Be still and know that He is God over your life, over your circumstance, over your finances, over your family. He will be exalted in your life. All you have to do is trust Him. Failures are stepping stones to success. When you fail, that's not the end. It's simply the realization of an opportunity to grow. Failure is the world's programmed discouragement to get you to stop. Because no one can fail if they don't stop. If you keep at it, there's no way you won't succeed. Once upon a time, when all humans lived together and spoke one language, God said, There is nothing that they set to accomplish that they won't. And that's the fact about man God created. Unfortunately, we have been programmed with a limitation. Failure. Failure begins from the mindset. How you see it. As an excuse to retire, pack your bag and go home. Or as an opportunity to forge ahead. Failure is only failure when you quit. It is not a failure until you give up. What many call failure is actually temporary weaknesses and shortcomings that expose room for improvement. Failure is like a mirror that reveals the dirty spots in your face so you could wipe them off. Failure directly and indirectly reveals the next step to achieving your goals. When you give up, when you quit, you have truly failed. That means if you have stayed and kept pushing, you haven't failed. In school, we were taught objective failure. When you score below a set grading standard, you failed. And as a result, you get punished, either by repeating the school year or get frowned at or grounded by your parents. In life, failure is subjective. It's no longer about the failure itself, but how you see the failure. What did you fail in? What standards did you come short at? If life were to be a restaurant, you cannot choose between failure and success. You will be served failure again and again and again and again. Failure is the door to success. Failure is the steps you must take to your desired destination. Remember the story of David, a classic example of how failure is the doorway to success. David was the least in the sons of Jesse. 
He was the smallest in class, the least performing student, the least performing manager, the businessman running at a loss, the losing politician. He was everything failure. Failure was written all over him. That was David. David was not doing well, so he was given the least task to do. He was made to shepherd sheep in the desert where fierce wild animals were. He was young, small, but he was sent into the wilderness to have sheep as his companions. Because obviously, he was irrelevant. His life does not really matter to Jesse, his father. So they couldn't care less. He was that irrelevant. Such that when God sent Samuel to Jesse's family in the search of a king to replace Saul, Jesse literally forgot that there was a son he had forgotten in the wilderness. He forgot David. David was such a big failure that his father forgot him. This same David was the one who killed Goliath, the same Goliath that his so-called more successful brothers ran away from. The same David killed a lion and bear in the wilderness. Saint David was anointed by prophet Samuel as the next king of Israel. David's story of failure did not stop there. David was such a massive failure, he ruined the good thing he had in the king's palace. He became King Saul's sworn enemy. He had to run away for his life. He was in exile for years and became the leaders of never-do-wells, failures like himself. He made those never-do-wells into mighty warriors, giant slayers in fact. David became the forefather of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. David was a man who stood with God's word. He kept God's word in his heart. He knew God's plan for him and he never gave up, even in the face of plenty challenges. David arguably faced the greatest challenges in the Bible, but David stood strong through it all. David never gave up. David stayed with God's word because he knew that failure is never the final. His failures were his badges. The story of David is not complete today without those failures. Your failure is not your end, but a process you must pass through to become the person God wants you to be. It's not possible to become insanely successful without ever failing. If success were a house, no matter how brilliant you think you are, you can't tiptoe past failure on the way to success. Failure is the front door. In life, failure is the currency of success. This is not a question of innate talent. You're not better or smarter than failure. You're not above it and you can't escape it. You're going to fail many times, probably more than you succeed. But there is good news. What we often consider to be a failure isn't a failure at all. It's an opportunity to learn why you failed, what you did that led to failing, or what you can do to better next time. This information you obtain from failures is like a currency you earn through the courage of taking action. The more times you fail, the more knowledgeable you become and the closer you are to achieving your goals. From this perspective, failure and mistakes shouldn't be avoided. They should be welcomed, embraced, cherished. If you want to achieve anything worthwhile, you have to let go of the idea that failure is something to avoid. Nobody wants to fail, but you have to be willing to fail if you ever want the chance to succeed. This acceptance and anticipation of failure weakens its sting and helps you regain perspective to get back on track, although you could even argue that failure is the track. Think of it this way, you win or you learn, and you win by learning. When you finally accumulated enough failures, you might have the chance to exchange your fortune of failures for a tiny bit of success. Of course, simply failing doesn't mean you'll succeed. But if you invest your failures wisely, you'll have much a better shot. In Genesis chapter 38, Tamar failed and yes, she failed more than once. Because what else is a failure if not having to bury your first and second husband, who were brothers, and Judah, the father of the two sons, was too afraid to give you his third son. He thought the third son might die too. She became a widow 
For years she was abandoned. She became a laughing stock. She was a typical example of failure. But she never gave up. She knew her right and gave birth to twins by Judah himself. She later became the foremother of King David and our Lord Jesus Christ. When we look at Jephthah today, with human eyes, we see a classic failure, son of a prostitute, a bastard. But God saw a mighty warrior, a righteous man, and the one who would save the Israelites from their enemies. We were taught early about failure, and it was reinforced by several things. Nobody taught us that being alive alone is success. We survived a one in a billion odds to be alive. That's a huge success. We were tricked to believe that failure is the end and that it was only success if we got it the first time. The seed dies before it grows. Most seeds grow downwards into the soil before sprouting up. To us, we think the seed was failing or has failed because it died or because it's moving down deeper into the soil. Remember that trees with the deepest roots are the strongest and the biggest. They are the strongest against wind and storm. But so you know that trees with the deepest roots take the longest time to grow. This means they were failures compared to the faster growing trees. It all begins with thoughts. Thoughts that you have when you are alone. Your most prevalent thoughts on success or failure. Are you confident of God's help? Words are instrumental to your thoughts, and that's why you should keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. The Word of God is the assurance that keeps you going. The feeling of failure can be depressing unlike success which excites and makes you happy and spirit lifted. But failure is a necessary evil, although now you know that this is not evil, but good. I've failed many times than I could count. But I also know that every time I failed, I was launched into another stage of awareness of new possibilities. Yes, it wasn't palatable, but it would have been worse if I had stopped as a result. It takes strength to see through the treasures hidden inside failure. It takes so much strength to see through lack of immediate desires, pain, hunger, disappointments, low grades, job layoffs, business crashes, investment loss, and so many misfortunes that happened to us due to some inadequacies of unforeseen events. These are truly painful experiences, and that's why you must allow God's strength to keep you going, even in the face of challenges. Just like the psalmist, say to yourself, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. It is God who arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. God is my refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Rest on God's abundant strength. Learn from your failures and never give up on God's plan for your life. Never give up on your dreams. Failure will come. Yes, it will. But now you know, failure is a major ingredient of success. Most failures aren't real. They are perceived. Because we are emotional creatures, we allow our emotions to get the best part of us. So you perceive every slight mistake or error as a failure. You perceive an uncontrollable catastrophe as a failure. Failure is only truly a failure. If you expect that you should always and immediately be succeeding every step along the way. Not only is that wrong, but it's also impossible. There's an entitlement to success that looms large at both a societal and personal level. We not only expect to be amazing at whatever we touch, but we expect to be amazing right now, regardless of the amount of work or sacrifice we put in. 
those who are willing to fail and view mistakes as boosts along the timeline of their own development are more likely to succeed than those who consider those same mistakes as indicative of their identity, worth, or natural inability. Because in the end, it's not about you. It's about the timeline, your patience, discipline, and willingness to make even the most frustrating mistakes over and over again in the name of progress. Failure is not the opposite of success, no. The opposite of success is not trying. And that's the real failure. When you give up, when you stop showing up, that's the failure by avoidance. And that kind of failure wrecks, not good. But the other kind of failure is failure by courage, failure by doing, failure by moving forward. Now that's some good failure. Although not really a failure, there are necessary steps you must take forward. That's why it's called failing forward. So keep failing your way to success. Fail, get back up, learn, try again, fail again, get back up. Learn and then try again and try again and try again and fail again and succeed. Just like King David, your story is not complete without failures. The failures are your fires that refine you to become the best version of yourself. In all of these, remember God's promise to you. For though the righteous fall seven times, they will rise again. Thank God in advance. A long time ago, some men were to meet with a certain rich man. They were strictly instructed to come as early as 6 a.m. in the morning. All 30 of them obeyed the instruction and came before 6 a.m. On arrival, they were directed to sit in a room and wait for the arrival of the rich man. Three hours later, the rich man had still not arrived and some of the men were beginning to complain and murmur for being kept waiting. No sooner than that, they started trooping out angrily in groups of one and twos. It was five hours later and the rich man still had not shown up. More people left. In the ninth hour, the rich man, humbly dressed, walked into the room and sat down on a chair. While others were complaining and murmuring, there was a particular man who kept on smiling. When he was asked why he was smiling in his unpalatable situation, he replied, saying, I do not mind waiting. I'm simply grateful to have the opportunity of being able to meet him, and I believe that he will be here soon. Others looked at him like he was crazy. They did not understand him. Little did they know that the person who had just joined them was the person they've been waiting for. By the 10th hour, there were only three people left and one of them kept hissing and tapping his feet on the floor to show his discomfort at having to wait this long. Then he stood up and left. Immediately after he left, the rich man stood up to address the remaining two people with the intention of revealing himself to them. As soon as he started speaking, one of them shunned him up immediately, saying that all he wanted to do was hear the news of the rich man's arrival. The man who had been smiling was all ears and ready to listen. The first man who shunned the rich man up looked at his counterpart in disgust as he hissed and stepped out impatiently. The rich man went back to his seat and decided to wait for another two hours in order to put the last man standing to a test. After the two hours had passed, he stood up and revealed himself as the rich man whom they had been waiting for. One would expect the man to start complaining for having been kept waiting. Instead, he continued with his attitude of thanksgiving and gratitude. This is not a story that only teaches patience, but also teaches the right attitude while waiting. An essential aspect of human life is the ability to appreciate things so as to receive more. It is essential because it is a very simple universal law. It applies to everyone, in every nation, and at every time. When you receive a favor, appreciating what has been done for you motivates the person who has done it to want to do more. If you give a gift to your friend or to your child and they do not appreciate your effort, it may discourage you from doing more for them. This is quite typical. 
We know that your attitude in times like this should be an attitude of gratitude and thankfulness. However, in what posture are we expected to stay when we are expected to receive something? How are we supposed to behave when we are waiting for a miracle, deliverance, breakthrough, or a provision from God? Would it be that we are to wait in grumbling and murmuring like the children of Israel? Or are we to wait, giving thanks and glory to God while waiting? Let's consider Abraham, the father of faith, who according to Romans 4.20, staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Abraham, the father of faith, who despite his weakness in the flesh, was promised a son. Even though the son did not come immediately after the promise was given, Abraham held on to the promise. According to this scripture, he was considered strong in faith because he not only held on to the promise, but he kept giving glory to God while waiting. Abraham's story teaches us the importance of not only staying strong in faith, but also staying strong in worship and thanksgiving. Like Phil 4.6 tells us to let our requests be made known to God through prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is an essential aspect of our wait. It quickens the move of God. In the book of Acts of the Apostles, 16 through 26, Paul and Silas were locked up in the prison after casting out a demon from a girl who brought many gains to her masters through the foul spirit in her. They were first beaten many stripes and then cast into prison with their feet bound tightly. It was recorded that while in prison, they prayed and sang praises to God. And what happened afterwards was that there was a great earthquake in the prison that released them from their shackles and left the prison doors open. Praising in the storm is the right way to go. There is a story of a king who had a lot of wealth and gave out gifts every three months. An old poor woman who lived in the neighboring town heard of the king's benevolence, so every morning she trekked from her town to the king's beautiful palace. Every time she got to the palace, despite how tired she was from the long trek, she bows her head and starts to eulogize the king. She would dance left to right in order to hail the king. At first, the guards tried to send her away because they felt she was being a nuisance, but they could not because her praises even got them dancing and worshiping their king whom they loved and revered so much. Soon, she caught the king's attention and she kept on praising him non-stop. Then the D-Day came and without any doubt or resignation, the king gave all of the gifts he had to the poor old woman, whom he had grown fond of from her daily praise visits. One would think that her visits would stop immediately. She got what she wanted, but it didn't. She continued to visit the king every morning to sing praises to him. Resultantly, the king blessed her with a beautiful house right next to his palace, plenty of farmlands, and both men and maidservants to attend to all of her needs. Yet, she continued in attitude of her thanksgiving. Giving thanks should be a habit as consistent as breathing in and breathing out. It should not only be for when you have received, but also when you are waiting. Like the story at the beginning, a lot of people wait in complaints and murmurs. Some people get very irritated whenever they are being made to wait, but the process of waiting helps you build your faith. So, while you wait, do it joyfully and merrily, giving all thanks to God. Why should you give thanks in advance? When faced with a challenge, trial, or particular problem, give thanks in advance because you believe that you've come out of it strongly. In fact, regardless of the outcome, Give thanks in advance because God is good. Psalm 136, 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercies endureth forever. Whenever he has done it or is yet to be done, give thanks. Give thanks because the Lord is good and his mercies endure forever. Whether things work out the way you want it or not, God's mercies are forever and he is good. This is a reason to give thanks. Another reason to thank God in advance is that it brings multiplication. When you thank God in advance, you will receive the answer to your prayers in many folds. 
like Jesus did when he thanked God for the five loaves of bread and two fishes. The disciples wanted Jesus to send the multitude away because they could not cater for them. Instead, Jesus asked for the little they have, and when it was given to him, he looked up to the heaven and blessed. According to John's account in John 6.11, Jesus took the five loaves with the two fish and gave thanks. When he had given thanks, he distributed it to those who were seated as he had instructed. Giving thanks in advance causes supernatural multiplication. Giving thanks advances the forces of nature to obey you. Lazarus was dead and had already been buried for four days when Jesus arrived. His sisters were shaken by the events, and they had resigned to accepting that Lazarus was already dead. In fact, when Jesus asked for the stone to be rolled away, Martha questioned his instruction. As recorded in John 11:41. Jesus looked up to heaven, and the, and the first thing he said was not, Oh, my father, how could you let my friend die? Nor did he say, I have served you day and night, yet you let my friend die? Please give him back to me. Instead, Jesus said as he raised his eyes to heaven, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me and listen to me, but I have said this because of the people standing around so that they may believe that you have sent me. Lazarus, come out. And immediately, Lazarus came forth. Despite the fact that he was surrounded by people who had unbelief, Jesus had the assurance that God is good and would always hear him. So instead of saying, prove it to them that I am your son, he simply gave thanks in advance. When you give thanks in advance as you pray, dead things come back to life immediately. Thanksgiving is the chemical that fastens the reaction of faith and prayer. When thanking God in your weight, do not only thank Him because you want to receive something, but thank Him wholeheartedly at every time in your life. Whether you are in weight or not, thank God at all times. It's like eating good food at all times. You don't wait until you are sick before you start eating well. You try to eat a balanced diet at all times. Thanking God in advance has been proven by the scriptures to be a way to cause God's hand to move for your good. So, from now henceforth, begin to thank God in advance instead of murmuring or being sorrowful. Remember that the habit of thanksgiving should be a constant thing in your life. Do not complain like the children of Israel whenever things are not working out. Instead, send up to heaven a sweet fragrance of your thanksgiving together with your prayers and supplication, and watch God do a mighty thing for your life. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. The Bible says Jesus is the prototype of the new creature. Jesus is our model, our example, and he has laid the right example for us. He woke up in the morning and went to pray, very early in the morning. Mornings are for us to refresh our energy, strength, and get ready for the day's tasks. How better do we refresh our energy if not in a fellowship with our Creator? God wants us to fellowship with him, he wants us to revere Him above anything else. He wants us to worship Him with all our hearts. Why? Because that's the best thing for us. When we do so, we set ourselves up for the best day. We prepare ourselves for success, for the best opportunities, for greater things that are beyond our wildest imagination. We must learn to worship God first in the morning immediately after we wake. This is how you commit your day, home, work, studies, spouse, kids, projects, family, boss, colleagues, staff, business, goals, plans, and every other thing into God's hands. The Bible says to cast your cares on the Lord, for He cares for you. God cares for you. He wants the best for you. He wants you to succeed. He wants you to become the best version of yourself, to achieve your goals, live your dreams, 
fulfill your destiny. God wants the ultimate best for you. He wants you to fulfill your purpose. He also wants you to live for Him. When you commit all your affairs in God's care early in the morning before going out, you set yourself up for ultimate success throughout that day. Things begin to work out in your favor. Even when things go the other way, you are not moved. Why? Because you know that God's got your back. He's on the wheel. There might be a few bumps here and there, but God's the one driving your vehicle. You cannot fall. A thousand might fall at your right and 10,000 at your left, but they will not come near you, says the Lord of the host. A day in the Lord's care is the best day ever. A day in Him is the best day ever. Commit your day to Him. Wake up and rest in His loving arms. Put all your burdens, all your affairs, all of you in His care and go out in victory because you are a victor already. Whatever comes at you during the day, whatever comes at you at work, at school, or wherever you go, you have the assurance of the Holy Spirit that you are a winner. Yes, you are a winner. Let God guide your steps. Let him order your journey. Let him guide you through it all. Jesus recorded a huge amount of victory in God's work because every day he wakes up in the morning and set apart some time to have a conversation with the Father. Weeping may come at night, but joy comes in the morning. No matter how bad the previous day was, joy comes in the morning. You know what else that verse meant? The actual morning is in God. The night is the world. Jesus said, in the world you have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. He said in me, you will have peace. The world is full of many things that can discourage us, sadden us, embarrass us, frighten us, worry, and make us weep. So when the Bible says weeping may come at night, the night is the world. The cares of the world. The morning is God. Joy is in God. In the kingdom of God, there is peace, righteousness, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Joy is a reality of God's kingdom, not the world. Joy is in God himself. And every morning when you wake up, you will do yourself the best thing by tapping from that abundance of joy. Drink from the reservoir of God's joy. Pour yourself, fill yourself with the joy of the Lord. Rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in what God has done. Rejoice in what God will do for you that day. Rejoice for what God is doing. Rejoice for the mercies of the Lord are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Let the aura of God's presence permeate your daily affairs and experience the victory of God in all that you lay your hands on each day. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. Psalm 143, verse 8. The psalmist understood the importance of mornings. He also understood the relevance of committing your day to God in the morning. He said, show me the way I should go. Show me what I should do today. Guide me. Give me wisdom to talk, to act, to do thy will, O Lord. This is not to say that when you wake up in the morning and doing something else asides from praying or studying God's word is bad. No, it isn't. But committing your day to God as you wake up is simply the best. That's all. It's best for your mind, for your day, for your work, and whatever else you will do the rest of the day. God is the best keeper of your life. When you entrust your life in God's hands, you can be sure 
that you're forever secured in his arms. Wake up in God. Wake up with God. His faithfulness is new every morning. Every morning is a fresh start in our lives. Mornings are wonderful. Waking up in the morning is an opportunity to thank the Lord. Now, imagine if you filled your morning with God. Could the rest of your day look different? Could your mind be renewed with peace, joy, and hope instead of comparison, anger, or stress? Spending time with God and in His Word can put everything in perspective. Your soul will be filled, your mindset renewed, and your stress can be replaced with His peace. Your morning routine can be an easy thing to overlook, neglect, or underestimate. The good news is that you have the power to choose to be intentional with your time. Make your time with God a priority and you can make a start by changing your morning routine. It's all about priority, the first thing in your heart. Jesus said, seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness. All other things will be added unto you. Seek the kingdom of God first. Put God first in all your affairs. Every day, in the morning, before going out, put God first. Put Him first. Let Him take charge. Starting your day with God also makes a statement. It says that you put Him first and He is a priority in your life. Whenever you spend time with God, it's always valuable, precious, and important. Don't start your day with life's demands. Instead, surrender to the one who has created you and all that you see. Make sure that God is the focus of your morning. That way, he will be on your mind all day. When it comes to everyday life, it can be pretty hectic and busy. You have so much to do and so much on your mind that it can be easy to put spending time with God on the back burner. This week, Spend time with Him in prayer. Spend time with the scriptures too. Look for ways that He is working in your life throughout your day. David was a man of worship. He understood what it means to spend more time in God's loving presence. He said, I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love because you have seen my affliction. You have known the distress of my soul and you have not delivered me into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a broad place. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts. Bless the Lord, O my soul. All that is within me, bless his holy name. Let the morning Bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. You know what God called David? A man after my own heart. That was David. That can be you too. When you fellowship daily with God, you put on the whole armor of God. Your mind becomes the mind of Christ. Your mind becomes solidified in what God has said about you. Your spirit, soul, and body are filled with the aura of God's presence. You exude blessings, good things, God's favor to everyone and everything around you. Nothing can stop you. No challenges can stop you. Hate, malice, bad, bad things cannot stop you. Sin cannot stop you. Anger cannot stop you. You experience the abundant mercy, joy, grace, faithfulness of God in its reality. God's blessings become your reality. It becomes what you experience beyond knowledge. Dear brother, dear sister, wake up to God's plan. Wake up to God's abundant blessings. Wake up giving expression to God's love to everyone and everything around you. For you are the light of the world, a city set on a hill. 
You are the salt of the earth. You are God's heritage. Show him forth in all that you do. Let his loving kindness permeate all that you do. Let it flow in your relationships, in your affairs, in your present and future. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Give God the chance in your life, not just by mouth, but by your actions. God told Joshua, meditate on the word day and night that you may have good success. He said good success. So there is a success that is good. There is the different kind of success which is good, and that is the success that emanates from God, a kind of success that is more virtuous than any other kind of success. And how do you have that kind of success? When you meditate on His Word day and night, the psalmist said, Your Word is a lamp unto my feet. Psalms 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. It did not say blessed is the one who does not sin, but the one who is not influenced by the wicked. How you shield yourself from the influence of the wicked, sinners, is by meditating on his word. And that person will be fruitful, like a tree planted by the riverside. God said, be fruitful and multiply. This is not just about procreation. It also applies to your life, your affairs. His command is for you to be fruitful and multiply. As you go out this week, be fruitful and multiply. Multiply, increase, be fruitful. That is God's agenda for you, to be fruitful. And remember this also, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We get afraid. We will feel fear. It started when we were little. We were afraid of noises. You feared falling, but you sat up and then you crawled. You reached up. You started getting up. You started walking and you walked. You were not totally sure that you could walk, but something inside you knew that you couldn't keep crawling. Something inside you knew you had to walk. You are grown now. A lot of things have changed, but some things didn't. The principle of how faith overcomes fear has not changed. You may have forgotten how you got up and walked when you were a baby. So God constantly reassures you. A lot of things may look daunting, but God wants you to remember. What he says to one, he says to many. Yes, our humanities may be limited. We may not see everything. We certainly do not know everything. But God wants us to focus on the things we know. Keep what you have been given. What you know is enough. You know that God loves you. You know that God thinks about you. Jeremiah 29 11 reminds you. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in a future. God says, I have intentionally got thoughts for you. I have a plan for you. I have good plans for you, good plans only. I have nothing bad planned for you. I am giving your life a favorable and desired outcome. You know that he is God, that his counsel will stand, that it is what he purposes that happens. And just in case you ever wondered if that scripture could ever be for you. So Psalms 3311 comes in and tells you that the counsel of the Lord stands forever as well as the thoughts of his heart to all generations. And for further emphasis, God tells you in Isaiah 4610 that he declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, he says, 
My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. This is what Joseph knew when he said, You guys meant really bad things for me, but God meant it for good. Imagine. So, you really have no business allowing fear to terror you, no matter what it is. No matter what it is, you have to know God's got you. Are you relocating? Are you entering an unknown territory? Are circumstances forcing you to do things you thought were beneath you? Are you trying to get new deals for your business? Are you meeting new corporations for contracts? Are you entering a new phase of your life? Because if you are about to do any of this, God knows. And he tells you in Genesis 46.3, Fear not to go down in Egypt, for there I will make you a great nation. Is it a project for you? There is something big you need to execute. Do you have big dreams? Do your dreams scare you? And yet you know you have to embark on them. Are you afraid you will get stuck or be stranded in the middle of nowhere? And in 1 Chronicles 28, 20, the Bible says, God will be with you. He will not fail you nor leave you until you have accomplished. Fear wants to hold you down and keep you aground whereas faith wants to give you wings. Faith will inspire you. Fear will seek to paralyze you. God knows fear will stare at you in the face, sometimes as tall as the Goliath. But you must remember, it is your duty to remember. Recall how the Bible says, forget not all his benefits. Be like David, who knew that the principle to defeating Goliath, the giant who already terrorized tens of thousands of soldiers of the Israelites, was the same principle of how he had defeated the bears and the lions. Remember your previous victories. Are you looking for a new job or afraid you won't get the promotion? You just need to simply remember how you got your first job. Remember how you got your last promotion. Your rest is in actually knowing that God loves you. Manifest God's love. Let the consciousness of being loved by God rest richly in you. You will have noticed that 1 John 4.18 says that there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Your faith will swell from reminding yourself of these kinds of words often and often. For the Bible says in Romans 10, 17, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I am not sure any one of us has ever had it as rough as Joseph has had it, who already started out life without his mother, having lost his mother when he was very young. Ordinarily, that was tough, but he had the love of his father, the father who made him a coat of many colors. The same coat did remind the brothers that they didn't like Joseph. Imagine how Joseph felt when he was thrown into the pit by his own brothers. Imagine how Joseph must have prayed, God, please spare my life. Do not let me die like this. And then they took the opportunity to sell him as a slave. So Joseph woke up one morning, the beloved son of a rich father, and then by sundown he was already a slave. Is that not what we call a wicked twist in fate? But God knew what his thoughts were for Joseph. Joseph could not have known he will end up becoming the most important person in Egypt. There, you see, is the whole essence of faith. You don't know. You just trust. That's faith. Faith is acting as though you know God is thinking good stuff for you. Faith is behaving like God is for you. Fear and faith are similar in a certain way. They both speak. Faith speaks and fear also speaks, but they use different vocabulary. One exudes assurance and hope, while the other reeks of hopelessness and despair. In essence, faith is making sure that the words of your mouth align with the words of God. Not just the general words of God, but even the specific promises of God over the particular issues that you otherwise are prone to worry about. The Bible says that you have the measure of faith. Every believer has the measure of faith. This means you can speak. Jesus said in Mark 11.23, Have faith in God, i.e. believe the capacity, intention, and readiness of God over your matter. 
Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4.13, We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. So when David saw Goliath, he remembered that God had helped him deal with the bear and the lion. David was not the only Israelite there. Certainly, there were many people, Israelites who God had helped too. But it was only David that remembered. The Bible shows us here that remembering is an effective way to deal with fear. Fear likes to creep up on people. Stop fear dead in its tracks. Remember, remember the previous similar things that God had done for you. And once you remember, the next step is to say it. David told the story twice. First, when King Saul tried to project his own fear onto David. You see, people will project their own fear onto you. You must not allow such fears to grab a hold of you. Saul said in 1 Samuel 17, you are not able to go out against a Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. Did you notice how Saul had at best only one-sided facts? People do that all the time, and most times it is the people closest to us. David had to tell Saul his story. What is your story? And when David proceeded to the face-off with Goliath, he still spoke. When you believe, you speak. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Talk about speaking boldly. Fear will get you thinking about yourself alone, but you must be like Joseph. Even when the continuous turn of events got him to prison, he still loved and served the prison masters and the fellow inmates, enough to notice if they were sad or moody. Faith serves. Joseph had problems of his own. He should have been afraid for his life. He had not seen his father for many years. He was alone. He used to be a loved son, and then he became a slave. And now he was a prisoner for a crime he didn't commit. Joseph embodies faith. When he shared his dreams, he ended up in the prison. As a faithful person, he continues to help other people. He interpreted the dreams of others. Fear wants you to focus on yourself. Faith wants you to focus on God so that you can help people. When David saw Goliath cursing, he was genuinely angry. Why should somebody curse the children of God like this? He must have thought. He wasn't thinking about himself alone. Fear is selfish. Faith is selfless. One gets nothing done. The other gets great things accomplished. Let the excerpt of this psalm always resonate with you. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall not fear. Though a host should encamp around me, my heart shall not fear. We go through stuff all the time. Some of them are depressing. Some are unsettling. We faced a host of situations every time. Some can be embarrassing, while some can want to be disheartening. I have these excerpts with you from Psalms 23 and 27, because I want you to choose faith.